kings, many kings that actually attempted to buffet Israel at the cost of their voyage out of Egypt to the promised land. We had kings like Sihon, the king of the Amorites. Until today, when the tales of God's mighty victory is listed, they will call the name of these kings. We had Og, king of Bashan, that this king was a giant in his capacity, that he was also part of the great accolades, that if you want to talk about God's mighty intervention in Israel, these are part of the nations that fell. When kings that are valiant fell, when the Moabites saw Israel advancing and they have heard the news of all other kings that fell in, in the front of these people, the king of Moab knew that it would, be, it would be foolishness to try to fight them by the sword because every other person that attempted to fight by the sword, they became victims. They, they were able to deduce that there was an invincible army that fights along with Israel. That although they look like novices, although they don't have any military training, but if they come against you, you will fall. And I'm about to show you what is responsible for this invincibleness that characterizes the nation of Israel. Because we have many of us here who is about or who are about to take steps, who are about to dare, you know, projects, who are about to believe God for something they've never dared into before. And you will need to itemize some of these tokens that is present in the life of God's people and is responsible for the victories that God continues to wrought with and through their life. The name of the king of Moab, sorry, I'm just setting foundation. Is that okay? The name of the king of Moab is Balak. And Balak realized that Og has fallen, Sihon has fallen, Canaan has fallen. He realized it to be foolishness for him to go and repeat the same approach that all of these other kingdoms did with this nation. Since their strength was coming from a divine realm, he needed to go and consult with a diviner so that let's weaken them from where they have their strength from before we can now attack physically. And so in a bid to weaken them from the place where their strength is hosted, he had to consult a diviner called Balaam. And Balaam was a prophet that was available for the highest bidder. <laughs> he, he, he was hearing the word of the Lord quite alright. God was speaking to him. But anybody who have the largest post, you are Balaam's favorite member. Do you understand? So what was happening is that because of the strange penchant that Balaam has for money and for favoritism, of course, as it pertains to monetary gain, God needed to reserve him as a standard. That even after he died, God used him to name a way. They called it now. Meanwhile, if you are a false prophet listening to me, just listen, don't laugh. It's not something to celebrate. <laughs> you know, there is a difference between a fake prophet and a false prophet. A person who is fake does not necessarily know to what extent he has deviated from the ordinance of God. He's just shadow boxing, doing guesswork, and he knows that there's no relationship between him and God. He's just doing, you know, for appearances. A false prophet knows that he is of the devil and he is willingly leading people into strange paths of deviations. Now, the father of prophetic falsehood is Balaam. That's where the, the thing started from. And the Bible did not only leave a way for him, it became a doctrine eventually. It's called the doctrine of Balaam. So a Gentile king went to meet Balaam, told Balaam that I heard. Remember, the context is Numbers 22, 23, and 24. I heard that whoever you curse is cursed, and whoever you bless is blessed. Please come and help me curse some people. Come and help me rain bitter words against them. And while they were talking with Balaam, the Spirit of God came to Balaam and said, who are these people that you are talking to? And Balaam said, you see that Balaam has a healthy relationship to even hear God. He told God that they came and they told me I should follow them and help them curse a strange people. 
who are becoming a threat to the nations. Amen. But when they came to ask for this favor, they left something that was his weak point. They say, as much as a room full of gold, we will give to you. If you can just come and curse them. At first, you know the way a spiritual man will first behave. He said, no, no, no. The truth is that anything that God tells me is what I say. I don't have time to say anything God is not saying. The king sent another higher level of emissaries. And the envoys came with honor this time. They say, the king said he will bestow societal honor on you. And you will never know lack again. If you can just come and curse these people. So he told them, give me time. Let me, let me pray about it. <laughs> Meanwhile, if Balaam wants to pray and seek God's face on a matter, he will set seven altars. On that seven altars, he would sacrifice bullocks and a ram on each. Then the word of the Lord will come to him. That night that he claimed that he wanted to hear from God, it came to pass that he decided that he was going to go along with them but that he is only going to say what God told him to say. Meanwhile, there is no need to go. You are already coming near the game, gradually, you understand? When he got to the camp and he met with Balak, the king of Moab, it became evident that the king just wanted to weaken Israel because he was threatened by their existence. And the moment he told Balaam to curse this nation Balaam opened his mouth to curse them and the Lord seized his vocal cord and instead of curse he began to bless them and Balak became so offended and said I have brought you this far to curse these people and you bless them Amen, Amen. Now let's go into the scripture because I just wanted to set that foundation he says in my emphasis for the night in Numbers 23 verse 21. Numbers chapter 23 verse 21. You know I asked for the amplified version. Can we, can we have it projected please? Amen. Everybody can we read together? One, two, three. Go. This is the reply of Balaam to Balak that the reason why my mouth only declared blessing over them is because God has not beheld iniquity in Jacob. Please, I need, I need us to go through the, the King James Version so that, you know, we have some connection to the topic. Thank you, Father. He has not beheld iniquity in Jacob Neither has he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him and the shout of a king is among them. This is why I cannot curse them. This is the reason why the prophet could not lay an utterance that will belittle or will put them in any harm's way because God has not beheld iniquity in Jacob. Neither perverseness in Israel and the Lord his God is with him and the shout of a king is among them. You see, that phrase, the shout of a king, is an idiom. It's an idiom used in Hebrew to connote the shout of the warrior king. That the praise of the warrior king is within them. The praise of the warrior king is within them now to understand what god has in store for us tonight every man is a custodian of a dimension of god 
there is no man that was not willed or gifted a particular dimension of God. Everybody has the capacity to unveil one dimension of God or another. Nobody is actually ever going to have the totality or will exhaust rather the totality of God. And so the best God does for us is that he unveils dimensions of his presence to us. Now, you can be sitting here and the particular valve in your spirit that has been open to fraternize with the divine might be wisdom. That is a dimension of God. For somebody, it might be power. That is the dimension of God. Now, everybody will have one area of God's dimension or another that is at work in their life, sweatlessly. However, if we are not able to discover the unique area of God's dimension that operates in our life and then build around it, most of the times we will end up chasing things that are not the natural area of our strength. The reason why I'm sharing this is because the Bible began to show us that although Israel is just coming out of captivity, there was a particular dimension of God that was evident in their camp and it was actually captured by that words, those set of words rather, the shout of a king is among them. Another way to put it is there is a dimension at work in their midst. They have the shout of a king. Meaning that you can actually buffet Israel on many areas. You can find them wanting on many fronts. But if it comes to this particular area of confidence of God's capacity to deliver. If it comes to this area of knowing God as a mighty man of war. If it comes to this particular aspect of assessing the Lord of hosts. Israel knew that dimension of God. So when the Bible says the shout of a king is among them, it's an idiom like I said, it connotes the praise of a warrior king is with them. The only way to, to describe what I'm sharing is that in ancient times when kingdoms still rule the earth, if a nation go to war and their king stay behind, the soldiers that are actually at the battlefront they will not have the kind of morale that another kingdom whose, whose king followed them to the war front. A kingdom whose king go to them to the war front and charge with them. The moment their king is leading the attack, all other soldiers are willing to lay down their life because they know that the number one citizen also came to this war with them. What the Bible meant by the shout of a king is among them is saying that the king over Israel is not in a temple, is not in a building, is not in a palace. He moves with them anywhere they go. And any day you collide with them, the presence of their king stirs their morale. It is this dimension that was responsible for impossible feats that they recorded. Who goes against nations that were built with war in mind? Look at the wall of Jericho. Israel will come, no sword, just a few priests with trumpets here and there. And then they start walking around a wall, quiet. You know why? There is the shout of a king among them. There is something that they know about warfare that other nations are actually bereft of. And so every time they are challenged with different wars to fight, there is always a new method. There's always a new mystery. There's always a new formula. Consistent in scriptures, replete in scriptures, you will see that there's always a finger of divine intervention with Israel. They appeared before the wall of Jericho as helpless men. The wall was so thick that chariots could go on the wall. People lived on the wall. Israel did not come with ladder trying to think of how to penetrate the wall. They started walking around the wall in silence. I want to imagine what the people of Jericho will be imagine. What kind of weird people are these? Who, what are they doing here? They think we are joking by the time we start. But Israel was walking. The instruction was to walk around and meet a quorum. Then the moment you meet that quorum, blast a shout.
Maybe you will know where David found his confidence from. The shout of a king is among them. That a, a valiant, a giant, everything physically will make you vulnerable before that giant. Imagine Goliath running against you and David was charging back. And the only thing that they had on his lip is you come before me with a spear and sword and shield but I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts. This is the king whose shout is among them. There is something about the mighty one in battle that Israel knew. Up until today, they are fighting over three proxy wars. And they are still warning anybody who dares to participate in this matter. It has been an allotment right from time. The shout of a king is among them. It is on the strength of this that you will realize that they are never ever frustrated. You will see a situation that suggests hopelessness. But there is a dimension of God as the mighty one in battle. So in the war of Jericho, while Joshua was strolling around, listening to the instruction of God, he thought that all that was happening is just the instruction God gave. But he saw a man with his sword drawn. And the man stood there as though he is just wondering. And Joshua went to him and said, Are you for us or against us? The question sounded like, choose, choose your words carefully now. Because you will not like what will happen. And the man looked at, looked at a mortal that they came to help. He says, I am neither for you nor against you. Behold, I am the captain of the host of God. So it means as Israel was moving, there is a spiritual host that was following them. This is why a prophet can tell God, open the eye of my servant. Let him understand why I am not perturbed. Let him understand why I am not shaken. Why though a nation encamp against me, I am not moved. Because the whole mountain was surrounded with chariots of fire. You know why? The shout of a king is among them. If you touch the average Israelite, he is confident that he is not alone. They know that in the midst of hostility, in the midst of crisis, that they are not alone. It is this dimension of God as the mighty one in battle. They didn't know much about God when they came out of captivity. But they found this one and they held it. This is what the diviner, although he was a diviner, he was able to identify a particular dimension of God that this man journey with the shout of a king. It's because we don't have shouts. There is no expression of the warrior king in us. That's why people just come and tell you something and you become depressed. You become moody. Before you know it, you are scared. Before you know it, there is all kinds of crisis. Lord, open his eyes. He says, they that are with us, they are more. There are only few people that will eventually join into this reality. The shout of a king. If you find them, they look like they are arrogant. They don't, they don't feel fear about anything man can do. Because, listen, you are not alone. That covenant is not for Israel alone. All of us, we are a partaker of the commonwealth of Israel. You too, the shout of a king is among you. If any altar, any calabash, any mirror, if they chant your name, the reply is the shout of a warrior king. It means that anywhere you are summoned in the spirit, there is a king that manifests on your behalf. Your king travels with you. Your king is with you. So he says that shout is among them. The only way I can describe what I'm sharing is that Israel will have high morale in battle all the time. 